I am Robin von Seldenek, President and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, and I will be serving as the moderator of this evening's event. This series has been made possible through a major grant from the National Endowment for Humanities. The goal of this series of programs is to explore the views and the political policies of individual presidents toward minority populations. We believe that these types of discussions among historians that include questions and answers from the public are opportunities for honest conversation and reflection. We are indebted to our fellow presidential sites, such as the Hermitage who is with us tonight, who are partnering with us on these programs. The format for this evening's event will be an interview with questions that I have prepared for our guests, but we will reserve time for questions from the audience. If you have a question, you may use the Q&A button on your screen to type in your question and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can in the time allotted. At the conclusion of this program, you will receive a short survey in your email. I encourage you to take just a few minutes and share your thoughts about this program and this series. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce this evening's guest. Daniel Sharfstein is the Dick and Martha Lansden Chair in Law and Professor of History at Vanderbilt University, where he teaches courses on American legal history, federal Indian law, and property. He is the author of Thunder in the Mountains, Chief Joseph Oliver Otis Howard, and the Nez Perce War, and The Invisible Line, A Secret History in Race in America. Erin Adams is the Director of Education at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, where she oversees the visitor experience, K-12 learning initiatives, youth development, teacher training, and lifelong learning programs. She has been with the Hermitage since 2013. We are hopeful that our third participant will be able to join us shortly, Catherine Foreman Gray, a Cherokee Nation citizen has been employed as a history and preservation officer for the Cherokee Nation for over 10 years. Catherine serves as a historian on Cherokee Nation's advisory committee on history and culture, and also on the board of directors for the U.S. Marshals Museum as the official representative for the intertribal council of five civilized tribes. She has been a speaker at numerous conferences and events where she enjoys presenting on the outlaw and lawman history of the Cherokee Nation and in Indian Territory. So I think what I will do is start with you, Erin, um, hoping you might be able to just give us a little background on a um, Andrew Jackson. Um, I will tell you, we offered people the opportunity to ask questions when they registered. And um, we had a couple who wanted to know a little bit about Andrew Jackson's upbringing and how did it affect his policy. So this might be a great time to really kind of set the stage for us on who Andrew Jackson was. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for having us tonight. Thank you again to the Wilson Library folks for envisioning this project and getting it kicked off. We're very happy to be a part of that. Uh, as you can imagine, talking about Andrew Jackson, not only his presidency, but his life uh, in the light of racial inequalities is a, is a rather fraught subject uh, sometimes. And just as, as one of our participants asked already, Jackson's views about people of other races uh, really does, really can trace its origins to his earliest upbringings. Uh, Andrew Jackson is uh, rather unique amongst our presidents in that he represents so many firsts and lasts and onlys. And one of those firsts is that Jackson is the first of our presidents born to parents who had immigrated directly from Europe to North America. Uh, so Andrew Jackson was uh, born in the Carolinas. Um, it's still a bit of part of the mythology where he's actually born, uh, that most historians agree it's North Carolina, Jackson said South Carolina, but in any case, uh, Jackson is born in 1767 um, in a community called the Waxhaws. This was a community far beyond uh, the Atlantic you know, seaboard settlement. Uh, this was well out into the frontier, into a mountainous area. Uh, the area was still largely inhabited, not only by Scots-Irish immigrants, of which Jackson was one, or Jackson's family, uh, 
was one, but uh, amongst the Waxhaw people of the Carolinas. And so he was growing up on territory that was still very much contested between the, its native population and the settlers who were flooding into this area. Jackson, though, never owns enslaved people until his adulthood years. His family growing up did not own um, folks of African descent in bondage. Um, he lived in uh, for a time in Charleston, South Carolina, but does not appear to have owned people at that point. And so that for Jackson, the ownership of human beings is really going to be a reflection of his adult life. And more than that, it's going to be a reflection of Jackson's ambitions for himself and how he wants to go about securing his goals for the future. Uh, and so Jackson um, is quick to out the Jackson practices the law. That is what gets him to Tennessee in 1788. So he's not from Nashville. Uh, when he comes, he decides pretty quickly that the practice of the law um, is important for growing his kind of social uh, profile. Um, men on the early frontier that were lawyers were considered the leaders of the community. These were the men that were you know, so important in getting those early principles and laws of the nation established within communities across the nation. So Jackson is already gaining a lot of that influential piece. He marries into the most important family in Nashville, the Donaldson family, who was the founder of uh, Nashville. He is going to serve as Tennessee's first congressman in 1796 when we achieve statehood from uh, separating from North Carolina. He's on the state constitutional committee. Jackson is on the Tennessee Supreme Court. He's an, a Freemason and helps to establish the Masonic Lodge here. So he is going to gain all of those influential roles and pieces. And certainly his military experience in the Tennessee militia, in the Creek War, and in the War of 1812 at New Orleans is going to just be the cherry on that particular Sunday. But Jackson's, the other two pieces of Jackson's personal road to advancement lies in the ownership of land and in the ownership of people. And where I would have thought Jackson started with the ownership of land, which was cheap and abundant here in Nashville, he starts instead with enslaved workers. Uh, and he begins to make investments into enslaved people who possess tremendous skill sets, blacksmiths, for example. Um, and Jackson is using the income from their services to become his first source of cash flow. So as Jackson begins to gain um, in influence in the community, it is very much dependent on his own involvement in the slave system. Uh, but as he moves into the presidency, we're going to see an absence of conversation in the presidency related to the laws around enslavement, um, social practices around enslavement. It's almost a non-issue in Jackson's presidency. But what we'll see as we take a look at his relationship to Native communities, his encouragement of the Indian Removal Act, um, what he outlines to Congress and to the nation as his vision for the future of the nation, uh, is going to have quite a symbiotic relationship between slavery and Indian removal. Um, but to finish off Jackson's life, he uh, first runs for office in 1824, is elected to the presidency in 1828. He does not win in 1824, reelected in 1832, adds two states to the Union, Michigan and Arkansas, both very intimately uh, connected with the Indian removal process. And then he retires from the presidency 1837 and passes away here at the Hermitage in 1845. So by the end of Jackson's life, it was 78 years uh, filled with one challenge after another. And Jackson's own personal challenges and his personal ambitions in his own mind are going to be a direct reflection of those ambitions for the nation. Uh, oftentimes, understanding ja Jackson separately from the goals of the nation uh, is sometimes a little impossible because he's so intimately involved uh, in many, uh, many critical moments of the nation's progress. The War of 1812, uh, the Indian land sessions that happen across the 18 teens and 20s, of course, the Indian Removal Act. So Jackson is, is going to have his irons in so many na nation building fires, it's almost hard to uh, separate the personal from the political in many ways. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate you giving us that, that little bit of, of background there. One thing that um, I think uh, um, in, in talking with 
different individuals in, in preparation for um, this evening's event, one of the um, things that came up that a lot of people aren't aware of, he adopted um, an Indian son, right? Is that um, a little during uh, one of the Indian wars um, and took him home and they raised him as their own? What's Right, and that is going to be one of those stories uh, that today people of Jackson's time found it a little hard to square with his Indian removal policies. We certainly as 21st century citizens, uh, that puts the brakes real quick sometimes on understanding Jackson's purposes and his intentions uh, in his relations with natives. So Jackson, uh, I'm going to hesitate to use the word adoption because it is certainly not a legal process in any way. It was not intended to have the weight of inheritance behind it. Uh, so Jackson actually acquires three Native American children during the Creek War, as it was called, and that was 1813 to 1814. Uh, as Jackson and the Tennessee militia and the U.S. 7th Infantry are fighting throughout Alabama, um, the encounters that Jackson and his army are having with the Native people of Muscogee Creek Nation are incredibly brutal. There's almost no distinction made between combatants and non-combatants. Um, uh, violent encounters are not limited to the perimeters of communities. They're often happening right in the middle of the community. And so there's a great deal of property destruction as well as uh, combatant and non-combatant loss. And in the process of these battles, Jackson at some point ends up with two boys uh, one was named Charlie, one was named Theodore. Those are their English names. We don't know their Creek names, unfortunately. Um, and we have one reference to each of those boys in a couple of letters between the Jacksons, uh, between Rachel and Andrew Jackson. And more than that, we simply don't know. They disappear from the record uh, thereafter. After the Battle of Tallahatchie, though, um, there, is the, uh, there is a moment when two of Jackson's soldiers, after the completion of the battle, they're counting heads, cleaning up, burying the dead, uh, and they come across a, a child who's about 18 months to two years old, so a toddler, and he is found under the body of a dead woman that they assume to be his mother. The two soldiers then take the child. Uh, they try to pass him off to other women Within, within this community uh, who for whatever reason will not take him. So finally the soldiers bring the child to Jackson and say, we can't leave him here, right? We, you know, he, he, he has to be cared for, what should we do? And Jackson's uh, heartstrings are tugged a little bit. I think that is fair to say Jackson himself had been orphaned uh, fully by the age of 15. He never knew his father. Um, by the age of 15, Jackson's experience with the revolution, his prisoner of war experience, his combat experience, and certainly his orphanhood is going to be the central life issue that shapes his uh, personal decisions ever afterwards. And so here comes this orphan to Andrew Jackson and Jackson sees no alternative but to take the child for himself and to send the child to the hermitage. He sends a letter along with Lynn Coya, as the child be becomes known, uh, explaining to Rachel Jackson, his wife, that the intention of Lynn Coya is to become a companion to their son, Andrew Jackson Jr. So it, it seems to be uh, clear from the records that exist that Jackson does not intend to enslave Lynn Coya. Lynn Coya is not intended to be assigned work on the farm, or in some of other Jackson's other economic endeavors, but he is to be raised in the home. He is to be tutored alongside Andrew Jr. And he's simply to be raised as Junior's companion. Um, that has mixed results, <laughs> uh, but the child's name is Lynn Coya, which I am told, and, and, and I'm told by people of uh, Creek language ability, that the word Lynn Coya is not a name within the Muscogee language, but rather it is a it is a title, it is a noun, and it means orphan. Uh, and so I think about what that means for Lynn Coya himself growing up. Um, it, it would be the equivalent of, you know, instead of your mom calling you to come into dinner, it would be the equivalent of her saying, orphan, come to dinner, orphan, mind your manners, orphan, obey your tutor, right? And so it's almost a title rather than a name. 
Uh, but Jackson has ambitions for Lynn Coya. He intends to send him to West Point. Jackson felt very strongly about the potential of West Point military academy and military education for young men. Um, but that dream fell through. Lynn Coya was apprenticed to a saddle maker here in Nashville and then died in the summer of 1828 at the age of 16 of uh, what appears to be tuberculosis. So Lynn Coya's life is short and fraught with many, many questions. But the, the extension, I think, of your question, Robin, is how does the presence of these three children then influence Jackson's decision making um, when it comes to the Indian Removal Act or, or other decisions he makes as he's fighting the Seminole, as he's fighting the Creek and working to expand and take ownership of land across the South? And the short answer is it does not appear to. Um, if Jackson's good at anything, it's creating an objective and sticking to the objective despite the obvious obstacles sometimes. Uh, Jackson is not an introspective person in any way. And so there are no documents that reflect any sort of internal conversation or conflict that Jackson might have had. But instead, the records that exist show Jackson's attention completely focused on the advancement of the nation and, and whatever obstacle presents itself, Jackson's job is to remove that. Uh, and so it's not personal, it's business. <laughs> that, that very worn cliche, I think for Jackson uh, would apply. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. that I think that's a very important piece um, because it shows the complexities of who Andrew Jackson was. And, you know, sometimes I think we often forget um, we're dealing with presidents who um, are human beings. And just as, um, you know, they can be very capable of doing some of the best and the greatest things, and we celebrate those, but we also have to reflect on some of the decisions that were not so great. And um, for Andrew Jackson, I think the one that seems to stand out so much is the Indian Removal Act and the what you know, we often call the um, Trail of Tears. Um, and in, in my understanding, I think Jackson kind of felt like it was a win-win for everybody. Um, and I, you know, I, I think looking back on that, we could, we could um, argue um, very differently on that. Um, but Daniel, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing a little bit with um, our, our viewers a little bit about the um, Indian Removal Act. And then um, I think um, it's very important for us to talk about some of those Supreme Court cases that were coming out of, uh, well, Georgia, uh, 1831, had two pretty um, big ones. So if you wouldn't mind discussing those, I think that would be really helpful as we learn a little more here about this. Sure. Th thank you so much. It's great to be here uh, with, with you all. Um, so, you know, we, we can think about uh, Andrew Jackson, the man, and we can think about the things he did personally that reflect on, you know, his views of race. And, you know, we could start with, you know, the uh, 1804 ad he put in the newspaper for a runaway slave, right, uh, uh, that uh, had a $50 reward, but an extra $10 per hundred lashes up to 300, right? Or we could think about his, you know, personal participation and leading of the, the Creek campaign uh, we could think about his, uh, I think he, he uh, personally took part in the uh, Chickasaw removal negotiations just down the road uh, in, from me in, in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, and you could think about you know, his uh, personal disapproval of abolitionists and uh, a, you know, personal support for suppressing abolitionist mail, right? There, there are all kinds of personal things we, we could think about. But I think it's more important to think about the uh, it, the systems that he set up. Uh, and a huge part of that is the Indian Removal Act. Uh, if you think about, you know, it, him coming into office, uh, it, you know, 1829, uh, it, you know, the, the Indian Removal Act was really uh, uh, the centerpiece uh, of his uh, early presidency. Uh, and you know, it, it's uh, it it is it, it reflects um, uh, it, you know at, at a basic level uh, he uh, didn't respect the sovereignty of native nations right and thought that treaty making 
uh, was, uh, a, you know, ki kind of a, uh, uh, a joke and that it should just be, you know, full federal plenary power imposing its will upon nations. That said, the Indian Removal Act um, uh, provided for uh, a wave of new treaty making, right, essentially to buy out uh, the southeastern tribes, right, the, the five civilized tribes, and establish uh, a, you know, land holdings for these nations uh, in, um, uh, in Indian territory, what, what became uh, uh, the eastern part of Oklahoma. And, you know, it's a, uh, a bill that was uh, hotly contested. Uh, it had serious opposition. Uh, and uh, Jackson's administration made it a test of loyalty to the president, right? That everyone who supported Jackson, if they really supported Jackson, they would support the Indian Removal Act. Uh, it's passage was uh, very narrow. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, the historian uh, Daniel Walker Howe uh, talks about how, you know, if it, you know, kind of mentions the, the connection between Indian removal and uh, slavery uh, by talking about how uh, if Southern states didn't have inflated representation in Congress because of the Three-Fifths Act, or Three-Fifths Clause, uh, uh, it wouldn't have passed, right? Um, uh, and, it, you know, by, uh, a, and in many ways, uh, clearing uh, millions of acres of land in, in the Southeast uh, essentially opened up the Deep South uh, to become, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, slave society uh, that's kind of fixed in our imagination of, of uh, what, what slavery would be. Now, the act uh, provided for this wave of treaty making, but the treaty making followed a playbook uh, that would be repeated again and again and again, uh, where the federal government uh, would uh, send uh, officers in, uh, commissioners in to make treaties, uh, but they would uh, be very coercive. Uh, they would find whoever would support it and then just sign the treaty with them and say that it bound everybody. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, uh, the Southern states were just itching to take this land. Right and again, the the connection to slavery was really clear. Right there, I, you know, uh, Daniel Walker Howe quotes a, uh, 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 or I uh, quotes uh, Joel Chandler Harris quoting uh, a Georgia song about how you know all I want is a big plantation up in Cherokee Nation, right? And uh, Southern states were doing everything they could, uh, including you know people just invading uh, the uh, tribal boundaries. Uh, and, uh, you know, marauding. Uh, and, you know, the, the Jackson administration did nothing to stop the states from doing that, even though it was the traditional role of the federal government uh, to intercede between uh, the, uh, the states and the native nations. Um, the uh, Jackson announced that he would not enforce the uh, the uh, what were known as the Non-Intercourse Acts, which uh, essentially established, you know, federal uh, it, that that the federal government would be uh, the governmental entity uh, uh, interacting uh, and ex and uh, exercising any kind of jurisdiction over Indian country uh, alongside the Native Nations and not the states. Uh, so Jackson stood back and uh, kind of let the states do their thing. And between that and the coercive measures of uh, his administration, um, there were, uh, it, you know, a, a series of treaties that that uh, led to, you know, several trails of tears. Right? It, it's, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a Choctaw Trail of Tears, the Cherokee Trail of Tears is is uh, it, uh, the Chickasaw Trail of Tears. Uh, there are all these different trails of tears, and uh, you know the, there are these systems of uh, partisan division uh, that that he kind of sort of set up. Uh, there are systems of um, uh, 
kind of setting up the, you know, his party as, you know, essentially the, the white man's party, uh, which, which becomes very important, uh, really, you know, for it, you know, a century plus afterwards, uh, maybe still important, although in, in different ways today. Um, and, uh, you know, and setting up, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a series of conquests, right? Even if it's just conquests uh, on paper, uh, but not always on paper, uh, that you see just uh, sweeping the continent uh, as as uh, uh, the border between Indian country and, and the US uh, moves westward. Um, well, you know, at this point, I do want to I do want to talk about one piece, and this was a question that I had reserved for Catherine, um, and that is to talk a little bit. Um, um, and I don't know if if one of you want to take the lead on this, in what the Cherokee Nation was like in the 1820s. Um, you know, I, I know under um, John Quincy Adams, um, there was a great deal of diplomacy, and I believe this is the time where they have their. Um, they, they come up with their written language and a constitution and how all of that came into play, um, especially um, with um, their chief, John Ross. Um, so would one of you be, or, or both of you, be comfortable talking a little bit about what the Cherokee Nation was, was like, um, especially going right into um, just prior to Jackson's presidency? I don't mind starting, Robin. Um, I did have, I'm so glad um, Dan mentioned um, all these different land treaty negotiations that Jackson was involved in. I pulled up two maps that I wanted to share with our audience, uh, but I don't want to get too far afield of our question either. So I can wait if you want me to, or I can go ahead and jump into the question now. <laughs> I think it would be great. Go ahead. And if you wouldn't mind, just show that right okay. now, because I yeah. think that visual right. will be just very helpful. What? Awesome. Well, that's just fresh in our minds. So let me share a couple of things. One, uh, I want to share a map of Florida by 1823. Um, the map that we're, let's see, can everybody see? It should just be a, a map of Florida territory right here in front of us. Uh, this is not intended, this is not a map of the Treaty of Moultrie Creek specifically, but just given the color coding on it, uh, this is a, a map connected to a much later period. But what it, you currently see that's in the pink, um, was what Jackson was able to wrest away from the Seminole Nation in 1823. The green area that you see just right there concentrated in the middle of the peninsula, right where like Orlando would be and all the way down as far as Lake Okeechobee, that was all retained as Seminole territory and then the Everglades are below that. So that is the map of Florida. But there is also um, a map that I wanted to share of... Um, those other Indian land sessions. And you'll have to forgive me because I took a, an iPhone photo of a page from Robert Remini's biography. Just, it was the best I could kind of get to at the moment. Oh, let's see. I'm sorry, let me stop sharing for just a second and I will get that to come back up and that will uh, help us. But while I'm hunting for that, um, well, let me try it again. While I'm hunting for that, though, just to sort of break into the question that you just posed, uh, and again, I think these, these images help kind of lead us into that. By the 1820s, you know, uh, the assimilation, if you will, of, of the Native uh, population to um, amongst most of the nations, right, not just the Cherokee, but amongst most nations from the southeastern United States, that assimilation process had happened, it had been happening since the 17th century. So it's not, this is not a new effort, right, that the, that the United States was trying to, to force natives to accomplish. Uh, so by 1820, the Cherokee Nation, for example, has a, a bicameral legislature. They have a national council. They have a Supreme Court. They have a constitution that is modeled on the United States Constitution. So in many ways, the Cherokee and the Creek and others are, are trying to demonstrate, you've been saying ever since George Washington that, that the policy is the assimilation of native peoples. We've assimilated, 
we've we've structured our 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 nation's governments. Um, there are many slaveholders in Cherokee territory. Chickasaw owns slaves as well, and others. Um, we're doing everything that the neighbors around us are doing, and it's it's the proverbial you know um, carrot and stick, right? You, you put, you know you go to reach for the carrot, and then the person holding the stick pulls it back just a little further from you, right? Um, so the, the map that I pulled up here, these are land sessions that were all negotiated by Jackson directly between 1814, which is the end of uh, the Creek War, uh, before the battle at New Orleans in 1815 through 1820. So this is a companion map to the one of Florida we just looked at. So when you look at this, look at how much of the state of Alabama, especially, uh, is the direct result of Jackson's um, the fight with the Creek. I mean, this is the result of the Creek War, the Treaty of Fort Jackson, which seeded about 22, 23 million acres of land to the United States. That's a tremendous amount of the state of Alabama, as well as pockets of Georgia. Um, those Chickasaw sessions are going to open up the entirety of what today is West Tennessee, Western Kentucky. And then you see um, these sessions with the, the Treaty of Dope Sand in Choctaw Nation, the Cherokee sessions um, that are already happening, even though, and I'll, um, I'm going to annotate it just very quickly, but in blue, I'm going to just quickly mark out what roughly, at least at that point, was still sovereign Cherokee territory, right, which is here. And look how much of this is already getting ceded to the United States at this point. So to say, as Dan so rightly said, to say that Jackson is the center of all of this, it is absolutely correct. The opening of a Southern United States and everything that comes with it, plantation agriculture, the presence of enslaved people, um, these rapid settlements, the um, forced, you know, the forcible pushing of settlers into um, being willing to violate boundaries between sovereign nations, right? It is, it is very clearly a result of Jackson's work uh, and Jackson's efforts uh, during this period. So I will, I will stop sharing my awkward map here <laughs> and uh, and then we can return to that. So, um, but Dan, I don't know if you wanted to pick up a little bit more just about, about Cherokee status kind of by 1820. Yeah, sure. So, you know, there it's a society, an agricultural society with uh, a constitution, a written language, uh, it, you know, quite prosperous and uh, among other things, uh, they were very sophisticated legal actors. So, it, you know, maybe it's worth um, uh, saying that, uh, you know, Cherokee Nation uh, by 1830 uh, had retained uh, some of the best lawyers in Washington, D.C. Uh, to, uh, you know, bring suit against the state of Georgia, which was, uh, you know, trying to extend its jurisdiction over uh, Cherokee country. And... Uh, it, you know, the uh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, uh, and then, uh, it, you know, Worcester versus Georgia are, you know, two very important uh, decisions uh, decided by uh, the Supreme Court at that moment. Um, and, uh, it, you know, to, to a certain degree, um, uh, it, you know, Jackson, even though it, it's a, uh, it, you know, a, a Supreme Court decision. It's not the presidency. Uh, it's uh, these are conflicts. Uh, one is uh, Cherokee Nation versus the state of Georgia. The other is um, uh, missionaries uh, who are outside of non-Cherokee missionaries who are mm -hmm. by the state of Georgia and it, for for being in Cherokee country. Um, uh, even though the presidency seems to be not a party there. Uh, Andrew Jackson really inserted himself into both of those conflicts, right? In in some ways, um, it, you know, the the uh, kinds of actions he was taking uh, with respect to uh, not other tribes besides the Cherokee at the same time as Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, I think, really intimidated the court uh, and uh, it, you know made the court worry that. You know, if there were a decision that robustly defended the uh, you know, the, the Cherokee's treaty rights, uh, that uh, it, Jackson just uh, wouldn't enforce them, uh, and it would uh, kind of 
undermine the, the legitimacy of the career as an institution, right? So, you know, Jackson kind of put those institutional concerns, made it a constitutional crisis, uh, and courts, you know, behave in, in kind of prudential, risk-averse ways during those kinds of crises. Uh, and then, uh, it, you know, Worcester versus Georgia, uh, when uh, John Marshall actually writes, uh, it, you know, very uh, uh, ringingly and courageously uh, in support of uh, Cherokee sovereignty, essentially adopting uh, uh, the, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, adopting one of the, um, a, uh, a, I think one of the dissents in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, um, uh, he, you know, he, Jackson, um, he, you know, there, there's no real uh, celebration in Cherokee country because, you know, the next five years are just agony uh, as Georgia continues to, uh, you know, squeeze Cherokee Nation and and uh, try and usurp land and infringe on their their treaty rights and Jackson just uh, kind of you know lets it happen. It's not just an action or incapacity. You know, it's kind of a willful decision uh, to to let the Cherokees twist in the wind and then uh, you know try and find someone eventually uh, who who would uh, kind of crack and. Uh, agree to removal that then they would try and bind everyone else. And, and you know, that's what, what John Ross wound up doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate both of you um, sharing that little bit of information that really kind of completes the, the whole picture of what's happening there. So thank you. Um, I um, am noticing the time and I do want to encourage anyone if they have any questions, please go ahead and um, type those in and we will be um, happy to get to those. Um, I am going to put you on the spot though, Aaron, because, and we've talked about this because this is something that we talk about is with presidential sites, is how we as a presidential site deal with these complicated histories of the human beings that, um, that we are here to educate on. And um, one of the things that I, that I often say is historians, it's our, it's our job to be objective, to share the information, to show the primary documents where, the, where we gain that information. But some of the subjects that we deal with have so much emotion tied to those and they're so emotional and rightfully so. Um, and there's something about the human brain that we really struggle with understanding that one person can be capable of such great things. Um, you know, look at the, you know, what Andrew Jackson did to um, really expand democracy, right? And how we see it today. But on the other hand, we look at some of these horrible policies. And so my question to you from one presidential site to another, how do you talk about his legacy with your visitors? Sure. Um, and there are so many layers to that question, it just in terms of the way the Hermitage has done it. Uh, the Hermitage was opened as a museum starting in 1889. Um, we're the second oldest presidential museum in the nation behind Mount Vernon. And so from the beginning, um, the impulse was certainly to capture those good things, right? The, the hero of the battle at New Orleans, you know, the exclamation point that goes on the end of the War of 1812. Um, westward expansion, right? Manifest destiny. We're, you know, we're moving forward, right? Look at how the nation is progressing. Um, look at how universal or white male suffrage at least is expanding under Jackson's time. He pays off the national debt, right? So it became the focus of our organization to stick with those high points. Um, you know, he beats off the first nullification, uh, first secession threat rather, right? So he's able, to, he's able to do these incredible things. And so there was so much good to talk about. Uh, and then when you layer that against just historic houses and just the desire to talk about the teacups and the furniture and the dresses and, you know, the, the babies in the nursery, um, you know, that filled up a visitor's time. Uh, so it wasn't until the 1980s that the Hermitage began to include K-12 education programs that both looked at slavery and at Indian removal. Um, and so that has taken, even those programs have evolved certainly over time, but with those programs, 
Uh, it has always been an intention of one, trying to put names on faces. So, it, in, um, so taking what is a very large and very cumbersome subject such as Indian removal and trying to bring it down here where the visitor can, can absorb it in a 45 minute program, a, a 20 minute house tour, you know, um, take some doing, right? And take some time to, to kind of polish all of those wheels. Um, we mentioned in our discussion the other day, I often think, I often worry about the 10 year old who's hearing this for the first time, um, you know, who fourth grade has got to be a pretty depressing school year because that's usually their first slavery content as well as their first Indian removal content in the system. And the questions that a fourth grader brings to the issue, frankly, they're just saying what the rest of us are thinking too, which is that I thought the president's job was to do good things for people. I thought the president's job was to protect the people. Uh, and then when they look at, um, you know, the U.S. Army and its involvement in Indian removal, I thought soldiers were those people who protect our freedoms. And so it really is for people, whether they're 10 or whether they're 90, it can often call up questions about some of those very intimate um, foundational concepts we have of our nation and our place in it. So we try to uh, address those through conversation, through exhibition content, audio tour content. Um, but in all cases, what we have committed to as an organization is, is to be a part of the conversation and just to acknowledge from the beginning, right? This is, this is a fact, this happened. Um, uh, I don't work for Andrew Jackson. I work for the Andrew Jackson Foundation, just as you don't work for Woodrow Wilson, right? And so we have to be free of any of that sort of sense of um, obligation in some way to the president himself so that we can address some of these very issues. So it takes a lot of forms depending on the audience. Um, the way I often, the analogy that I often use, and, and Dan, you can <laughs> just close your ears for a second, Dan. But I often describe this to kids as saying, it's like I'm a lawyer, right? And my job is strictly to provide the jury with the and the judge with the information that they need to make a decision, right? And then the decision, what you do with that information, how you apply it in your life, how do you make it part of the way you see the world uh, is very intimate, and a very personal process. And that needs to be in your hands. So not a perfect analogy, but it works pretty well for a fifth grader. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I think that's uh, that. I think that's a great analogy. Um, you know, it's part of what we do is we give the information, and then we encourage people to go out and and make their own opinion and and to study and to further research. Um, I think um, if we don't talk about those things, and we, you know, I, I hate to see that sometimes in our our society and our culture, we just automatically shut down and don't want to hear anything about someone that we disagree with or we think we know everything about them because we've heard one piece and that that does none of us any good. Um, so I have some great questions that are coming in and I'm gonna skip around a little bit here. Um, one is um, from my friend Nancy in Florida and um, her question is, what ultimately happens with the Indian lands when they moved? Who got the Indian lands? Was this a popular decision at the time after the, after the um, Indians had been forcibly removed? Great question. I, I can uh, give a brief answer and then Aaron can, uh, you know, uh, elaborate because it probably needs elaboration. I mean, my, my sense is, uh, you know, if you think about uh, the uh, opening of the Deep South, uh, you know, there were, uh, it, it was a uh, uh, feeding frenzy, you know, in um, lots of uh, parts of uh, Mississippi, for example, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Choctaws, for example, had, um, were, some of them were given allotments and could stay in Mississippi and didn't have to move. Uh, but uh, there was, uh, it, you know, such a land grab, uh, and it was, you know, big land syndicates and speculators, but also, uh, it, you know, 
small timers, uh, everybody just trying to, to grab as much as they could. Uh, and there was a tremendous amount of um, uh, fraud and coercion uh, to uh, you know, get the land that uh, Choctaws had actually been allotted, but then the land that had, uh, uh, it, you know, people had been forcibly removed from uh, was was uh, it, you know even um, uh, it, you know more uh, of an open season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that, and just to expand a little bit. Um, you know, there are ads in newspapers all over the nation, not just in Georgia or not just in Tennessee or not just in Mississippi, but they're, they're advertised far and wide. And it's advertising land lotteries. Um, some of the headlines that you often see on those ads say things like, um, seek the riches of Indians, um, Indian land for you, you know, and it's, it's really um, pitched as an enticement, right? Like the, you know, there's all this richness to be gained and all you have to do is reach out for it. So today they're the kind of um, situations that I would hope at least would never hold up in a court of law because these are people who have no title whatsoever to the land that they are selling. And so it's, it's as Dan said, it's, it's fraudulent from start to finish. Um, you know, those, those lottery agents and, and speculators and so forth have no legal title to what they're doing and just running roughshod over the, the title rights of others in a way that today would be deeply, un, you know, deeply unacceptable. Um, in, in a court of law, you wouldn't stand for it. I wouldn't stand for it, right? And we'd have lawyers who'd back us up and so forth. Um, but in addition to, to the, the theft of the land itself and what they're doing to the land, um, whether they have acquired, you know, whether they purchased it and driven off natives at that point, they're also creating a, a profound environmental catastrophe as well. Um, thinking about what's happening in Cherokee Nation as gold is discovered around the town of Dahlonega, I mean, it is, it is driving off wildlife, it leads to overfishing, the process of mining and panning for gold is choking out rivers and waterways. Uh, and it is just, it's an ecological disaster in addition to a legal disaster and humanitarian disaster. So it is, it is about as bad, I think, as you can, uh, in, in, in any direction as you can imagine it is. Catherine, we're glad you were able to join us. No worries at all. No worries at all. So uh, we have been having home and ready at 630 and like ready to go. And then I logged in and saw that email from Andrew and he's like, are you having trouble? And I'm like, no, I'm like 15 minutes going in and <laughs> oh, uh, I'm so frustrated. I'm so mad. No worries. We, we, uh, um, have a, a Catherine is in Oklahoma, and so we have a time change that that we're dealing with here. So um, we have come, just to kind of get you up to speed a little bit. We've talked a little bit about Andrew Jackson's life. We've talked about the Indian Removal Act, some of the law cases around that. Um, I, Daniel did a great job of talking a little bit about um, Cherokee Nation and what it the kind of the almost like the Renaissance it had in the 1820s of you know the Constitution and the written language. Um, I, you know, I would love to hear um, a little more about the Cherokee Nation if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us and kind of the history. It's you know one of the the, the, the five tribes of the South and um, just sharing with our audience a little bit about that history. Um, and moving forward. Yeah, I mean, as the history relates to Andrew Jackson, you know, it's definitely a complicated history, especially with Jackson and Cherokee Nation. Um, you know, we thought he was an ally of ours initially, and, you know, we supported him, you know, helped defeat the, the Red Stick Creeks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Um, one of our leaders at the time, General Luska, he is actually quoted as later saying, um, you know, that had he known what was gonna happen, he never would have saved his life at, at Horseshoe Bend. Now that's, that's a story that I'm not sure has been confirmed, but it's definitely something that gets kind of um, talked about here within the tribe. And so I think the one thing that when you discuss Jackson and the natives and especially the Cherokee nation, you know, we were very united initially against Indian removal and what really begins to happen is the division that starts happening between um, our people. And so that's one of the things that, you know, we say the federal government was great at was dividing us natives. And, 
you know, we were all against removal um, up until about 1832 is when you start really seeing that shift of Cherokees that believe removal is going to be inevitable um, for us. And so what we need to do is just take the best deal that we can get and go ahead and remove West. And so this definitely causes a split, um, you know, within our tribe. And so, and it's something that I will still say still resonates with us um, even today that, you know, when you start talking, you know, Ross party or treaty party, um, those that signed the treaty with um, the federal government who were killed, um, you know, for, for their role in signing that illegal treaty with the federal government and the fact that it was ratified in Congress just by one vote. And, you know, we were given two years to either move on our own or we were going to be rounded up and forcibly removed. I mean, there's just so much that happens after the Indian Removal Act in 1830, up until the time that we're removed. And, um, you know, the losses and, and a lot of us will always blame Georgia really is who we, we kind of put the blame on when, when it comes to what was happening to our people um, prior to removal. But um, yeah, Jackson is definitely one of those topics that, you know, we can spend hours debating and talking about, you know, his role with us. That um, leads me to another question that came in, and I think this is a very interesting question to discuss, and that is, um, can you briefly dis to explain the relationship that um, Cherokee Nation has with the Hermitage, or vice versa? Is there a relationship? Have you been to the Hermitage? You know, the, what are the, how, how do you um, work together? Or do um, you? I have. Yeah, I have. Um, I was invited to um, a few years ago to help with, they were updating some of the exhibits and I was invited to, to go and, and help with some of that as far as the video portion of it. And so, like I've said earlier before, like in previous discussions, I think that they do a wonderful job at the Hermitage um, talking about the history of Jackson and the complicated history that he has um, with the native tribes. Uh, when I went there a few years ago and toured the site, and it was something that I had, I had put off for a long time. It was just one of those places I never really wanted to go or had the desire to, to visit. Um, but the staff there is just wonderful. And I learned a lot about, you know, the slaves that were on the property. Um, you know, they talked about Lincoya, the, the boy that had been a, you know, his family had been killed during one of the battles and, and Jackson. And so it was one of those things that you start learning another side of Jackson. Now I can't feel any empathy for, for him, but it's definitely, it, it makes you think about him as a person and, you know, how he grew up and you start looking, he's such a complex individual. And so it was just, um, it was a lot to take in, you know, to visit there for the first time, but the staff does a wonderful job of interpreting the history and we appreciated the fact that they had reached out to Cherokee Nation and some of the other tribal nations to make sure that our voice and our story was correctly and accurately told there. Great. Erin, anything you want to add on that, that end? Or? Uh, all I can say is I think um, those cases where we have been able to work together has been a very rewarding experience for both of us. It just it just provides our staff, I think, often with the um, conviction and sort of the catalyst that it needs, like just the reaffirmation, right? We need to stay on this path. We need to stay on the path of, you know, of opening this story up, of being um, brave enough to tackle it, you know, even in the face of, of, of folks who uh, clearly don't want us to, because we get those people often, right? It's, um, I like to think that the further we get, you know, down the road of history that people begin to realize, okay, you know, Jackson wasn't always this hero, right? Maybe let's talk about some of these other things now. And then I'm just gobsmacked sometimes by, by, by those people who really want to resist, you know, having those conversations. Um, and so it, it, it's, yeah, having worked with Catherine and, and her colleagues just has, and, and uh, with other Native nations, like it is, it is just doing a lot to, keep reaffirming that whatever is happening, we need to stay on the path of, of committing to that story, for sure. Okay. Um, I have a couple of more questions here. Um, one um, from my friend, Patty. Um, she says, um, thank you. She's learned so much from the presentations, but wondering how the current national wrecking, um, excuse me, let me re start this. 
wondering how the current national reckoning on race and questions about who is writing the history of various groups is affecting research, writing, and teaching. Well, I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, one of the things that, you know, this is, this is being brought up a lot nowadays, but it's one of those things that I feel like as historians, a lot of us have been telling this history for, for years, for decades. And we've been, you know, my background is with interpretation and, um, you know, just making sure that all sides of the story are presented um, when it comes to individuals or events in our history, you know, whether you love or hate somebody or, you know, the, the, have a varying opinion on, on different aspects of, um, of events. Um, I think it's our obligation and responsibility as historians to just make sure that we put all the facts out there for people and allow them to make their own decision on how they feel about, you know, certain people and events. And it's something that, you know, they do a great job of that at the Hermitage. I mean, I heard more about the slaves and, um, you know, the, the natives, then I think more people, I think a lot of people didn't realize that, you know, that that was a huge part of the, the story there at the Hermitage and that it's something that they don't shy away from it. I mean, warts and all, um, you know, and to me that makes for a much more interesting and fascinating story when, when you include all, all aspects of it, good and bad. And I, I've certainly found when, or certainly found when, when I've taught, uh, when I teach uh, issues relating to slavery, when I teach issues relating to uh, civil war and reconstruction and its aftermath, uh, when I teach uh, about Jim Crow and civil rights, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is a moment when um, uh, students are locked in uh, and just really interested in learning more. Uh, and I think uh, when I first started teaching uh, 15 years ago, uh, it, you know, maybe it was a little more of a sell for it, that you had to do for you know why this is relevant to to people's uh, lives, to their legal educations. Uh, but now, uh, it, you know, I think people are really seeing how you know certain things uh, are you know reverberating today. You know, if we think about Jackson expanding democracy, you know, it, it's uh, and expanding what citizens means, you know, it's, it's a model of citizenship, you know, for the view, right? It's, it's a model of democracy that is essentially a settler democracy that's rooted in land, you know, from, uh, you know, removed nations and human property. Uh, it, you know, the, these are uh, things that, uh, it, you know, for better or worse, we're, we're really living with now. I would agree, and just to, to add to that, and, and kind of go with me here for a second, because I want to try to link just a couple of things. But you know, when Jackson is is first communicating his views to Congress, to the nation about as president, how does he view you know the future of of Native peoples in the United States? It's all couched in this language of the decision he's advocating for, the steps he's advocating for. It's not just because it's what he wants to do; it's because this path, in this case, Indian removal, that the path of Indian removal reflects the character of the nation. And it is, and, it, and, it, and, it, and you know, a, a true citizen, a good citizen who cares about the future of the United States is going to see, is going to take Jackson's perspective on things, right? And people of Jackson's time certainly, you know, resisted that, even though it passes, there are many strong voices of resistance. Uh, for example, Catherine Beecher, right? It's, it's the first example of women's mass activism in the United States, and it's against Indian removal, not against abolition of the emancipation of slaves. Um, so when we look at that today, right? Because, you know, who are we as Americans today? Does what Jackson was advocating for in the 1830s does that still apply to the character of the United States today in which we are agents and we are complicit and we have the rights to you know, speak up and to reach out to our elected officials and to try to shape the course of the nation? Does, does Jackson, all of this idea that somehow Indian removal reflects the character of the United States, Indian Removal Act is still law in the United States today and all of its aftermath is still law in the United States today. So does that reflect us? Is that the character of the nation today? 
And so then I think when people begin to see it that way, it you got to grapple with it, right? People of our time have to grapple with it. That's, uh, that's it. You just have to. Well, I, th I think um, you hit on some, some, some very important points here and um, our work as historians and as Americans and as we mm -hmm. understand and learn, um, there is so much to our history. And um, I want to, uh, you know, I, I, I wish there was just this easy answer on how you deal with all of these issues and there's not. But I think one of the keys is, is having these discussions where we can talk about it. Um, and I want to thank the three of you so much for participating in this this evening. Um, Dan, it was interesting. I had a question that came through for you and you answered it exactly. I didn't even ask. And it was talking about what do students today, basically what, you know, what are, what are their notions coming in? And, and you um, answer that. So thank you. Um, I do want to say that this program series will continue next month as well. Um, it will be a conversation on Abraham Lincoln. And at that time, we will be joined by Christina Shutt, who is the executive director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum in Illinois, and by historians Edna Green Medford and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. The program will begin, um, excuse me, will be held Thursday, February 10th at 7 p.m. And, and that's East, um, Eastern. And once again, I would like to thank Daniel, Catherine, and Aaron for sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. I wanna thank all of you who tuned in. Um, want to really thank you for attending um, this, this session. Uh, I encourage everyone to take a few minutes and fill out the survey that we'll be sending you. We look forward to seeing you next month. And on behalf of all of us at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, we wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you.